Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, special election coverage from Montreal. Two weeks before you vote, the campaign is heating up. Aaron O'Toole is using coded language. Mr. Trudeau, divisive U.S. style politics. Plus, we'll look at why, once again, Quebec is such a key battleground. Everything has changed. It's really too close to, too close to call. <laughs> Also tonight, questions and concerns on the eve of a more open Canadian border. And definitely, it's too, it's too early. At least let's, let's get this uh, fourth wave pass. And a back-to-school crisis for too many Canadian families. If we could get support to them for school supplies, that's one thing less off their plate. How a full backpack can make such a difference. This is The National. Well, it is good to be back. My old stomping grounds. You're looking at Place Jacques-Cartier in the heart of old Montreal. There is an energy here that I have sorely missed. And what better place to set the scene tonight in what is very much a battleground province. Now, Election Day, exactly two weeks away. And from here on in, you can expect the focus to sharpen for voters, the candidates, and the party leaders. Perfect time to take the national on the road for a closer look at your concerns and their campaigns. Now, Adrian will be in Calgary tomorrow where politics and the pandemic certainly go hand in hand. But tonight we are in battleground Quebec. If the Liberals hope to turn a minority into a majority, picking up seats here was a must do. But recent history shows very clearly how this province has a way of defying expectations. Quebec has switched allegiances dramatically, with dramatic implications for the country. In 2011, an orange wave swept the province, catapulting the NDP into official opposition status for the first time ever. Didn't last, though. In 2015, NDP support cratered and the Liberals surged ahead. That helped Justin Trudeau form a majority government. But if the Liberals were hoping to build on that success in 2019, boy, were they disappointed. The Bloc Québécois took seats from everyone regained official party status and became a force in the province once again. Now, we'll look at what's happening in Quebec throughout the program, but let's begin on the campaign trail where the leaders had sharp words and where protesters this evening hurled profanities and more. It happened as the Liberal leader was leaving a campaign event in London, Ontario. Some in the crowd threw what were reported to be rocks and gravel. Surrounded by tight security, Justin Trudeau was able to get on the bus and left. In a tweet tonight, Aaron O'Toole condemned the actions of the protesters. But that wasn't the only indication of a campaign intensifying. The rhetoric of those two leaders ramped up today as well towards each other. David Cochran explains why. The Liberal campaign has been a beacon for protesters since the election's opening days. You couldn't even make us a drama teacher! Angry crowds chasing Justin Trudeau, and Trudeau trying to link them to Aaron O'Toole. That on vaccines and on so many other things, Aaron O'Toole is at least taking some of his cues from them. There are two weeks left in an election Trudeau called with the polls suggesting he could lose. And so a clear attempt to make the stretch run about the other guy. Aaron O'Toole is using coded language, weasel words, to try to make his position on military-style assault weapons sound reasonable. It's been upsetting to see Mr. Trudeau each week of this campaign import divisive U.S. style politics. But after the liberal attack on gun policy, O'Toole pivoted, throwing out a platform promise to scrap a liberal ban on assault style weapons, hastily adding a footnote to the conservative platform, promising all firearms that are currently banned will remain banned. That after one of his MPs, Rob Morrison, insisted on Facebook, conservatives will repeal the gun ban forcing O'Toole to publicly overrule his candidate. I'm the leader, and we will have an approach focused on public safety, focus on maintaining restrictions in place. O'Toole says the gun debate should focus on crime. Trudeau says this is about character. And what we're increasingly seeing from Aaron O'Toole is that he doesn't meet that bar. 
Trudeau's closing argument in this campaign will seek to disqualify Aaron O'Toole in the minds of voters. He's got two weeks and two debates to move the polls and try to save his job. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. Now, those leaders and Jagmeet Singh were in vote-rich Ontario today. And this being Labor Day, they were promising more benefits for Canadian workers and support for the businesses that employ them. Evan Dyer takes us through it. Nothing says Labour like Hamilton, Steel Town. This is a worker city. And it's where Jagmeet Singh pitched his idea for paid federal sick leave. We want to make sure that no one ever again in our country goes to work sick. Hey, yeah, you? Appreciate you. In federal workplaces, the NDP says it supports a $20 an hour minimum wage and 10 new paid sick days. It says it's asked the Trudeau government for that 22 times since the pandemic began. Happy Labour Day. Steel was also Justin Trudeau's Labor Day metaphor, a mill in Welland, Ontario. We'll extend the Canada Recovery Hiring Program, which makes it easier not just to hire people, but to boost wages to address the labor shortage some sectors are facing. How are you guys doing? Trudeau says a Liberal government will also grant 10 days paid sick leave to federally regulated workers. Canadian workers in their families are struggling. And the Conservatives are making promises to workers too, including doubling the Canada workers' benefit and paying it out four times a year instead of once. Making these changes will help 3.5 million families pay the bills and put food on the table. For someone earning between $12,000 and $28,000 a year, this will represent a $1 per hour raise. Both workers and employers worry that the pandemic might have changed the workplace. More than ever, those employers are coming back, um, pushing to cut back. A lot of, uh, of, of um, rights th that those workers had. We're wanting to make sure that there aren't any major unintended consequences of some of the policies that the parties are putting on offer to try to court the, the working Canadian vote. Their biggest conflicts may lie ahead, with the possibility of laws allowing employers to mandate vaccination as a condition of work. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Chelsea, Quebec. Now we have much more special election coverage ahead from Quebec, including a tight race in the community of Trois-Rivières. When the campaign started, I could have bet on the Liberal, but now it's been only two weeks and everything has changed. It's really too close. I spent some time there this weekend, and I'll show you how voters there could deliver quite a surprise on election night. Now to COVID-19 and that fourth wave of infections we have been tracking. Lots of things change in our lives after Labor Day, right? And the pandemic is going to touch them all. The upward trend has been evident for weeks now. Right across Canada, there are more than 35,000 active cases now. Last week, the case count rose by 24%. And people are still dying from COVID-19. 116 people in the past week. That's up 15%. Hospitalizations are up 22%. And it is the same story in the ICU. More beds being filled. So that's the backdrop for a major change at Canada's borders. As of midnight Eastern time, travelers around the world are able to enter if they're fully vaccinated. That 14-day quarantine, no longer required. But visitors will have to show proof of vaccination as well as a negative COVID test result within three days before arrival. And they'll have to submit their travel info either online or using the Arrive Can app. So, some precautions still in place, but also the risk of more contacts, more people. Renee Filipponi sets us up for what's coming. It's been rough times for tourism during the pandemic. In better times, half of the customers who ride this boat would be tourists. And the manager is ready to welcome back international visitors. That's great for us. Like, I'm, I'm super happy to see them come back, um, you, you know, as long as they're double vaxxed and playing it safe. Back in early August, double vaccinated travelers from the U.S. were given the green light to come to Canada for non-essential purposes. And officials say the testing and surveillance program is working. We have a lot of safeguards prior to them arriving, and they may still be selected for some mandatory random testing on arrival because we do have this surveillance program. So we feel quite confident. We need to move forward and we need to do it in a safe way. This infectious disease expert supports the move, but will be watching to see if it leads to increased transmission. We need to not have 
cases come into Canada and importing these new variants that are more contagious, more dangerous, or both. This luxury resort in Tofino markets its remote location and raw beauty to an international audience, but doesn't expect a rush of guests right away. The overseas markets naturally, as you would expect, do plan further ahead. Um, and they often you know, are planning for a vacation of, of two to three to even up to a month in Western Canada. For those taking in the sun on Granville Island and enjoying staycations, there are mixed feelings. We should, we should wait longer, we should wait longer, definitely, it's too, it's too early. At least let's, let's get this, you know, the, the fourth wave pass. I guess if you're double vaxxed and you wear your mask inside all the time, I feel okay about it. There is still so much uncertainty as Canada takes this step out of the pandemic and reopens its doors to the world. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, as the government pledges to make full vaccination a condition for travel within Canada, it could come with a real cost for people who live in the north. Commercial flights there can often be more of a lifeline than a luxury. Juanita Taylor shows us some of the challenges. Traffic 267 for equity. Air travel is a lifeline across the territories. It's the only way in and out of many northern communities. Travel is not a privilege in the north, it's a necessity. Residents of remote areas in the Yukon, Nunavut and the Northwest Territories must travel by plane for many reasons, like medical appointments, athletic tournaments, even school. They also rely on plane travel for many basic necessities. Uh, imagine your groceries, your medication, your, your birthday cakes, your everything uh, needs to go on aircraft most of the year. Air travel is needed too for women escaping abusive relationships. When victims are fleeing, usually they need to get somewhere quicker where they can be safe. This advocate with the YWCA is wondering how she's going to help women in remote communities get to shelters if they're not vaccinated. If they have to fly in, that's going to be an extra huddle for them now to have to overcome because as we know at this point, not everyone is vaccinated. Even though vaccination rates are high in the north, she says Ottawa needs to do more to encourage vaccine-hesitant Canadians to get the shot, especially in remote northern communities like Colville Lake and WT, where only four flights come in per week. We really need to consult with uh, the people that really rely on some of the, the flights. But in this Nunavut community, residents say travel restrictions can't come soon enough. And it's scary that there's a, a new variant going around right now. And we're lucky we haven't caught it. It's been weeks since the federal government said vaccinations would be required by all commercial airline passengers in Canada. And it's still unclear when that mandate will come into effect or if any exemptions will be made for the North. Juanita Taylor, CBC News, Yellowknife. Now in Manitoba, we are learning more about the surge in COVID among young people. Since mid-June, more than a third of new cases were in those aged 18 and under. 17 have ended up in hospital, but so far none in intensive care. Almost weekly, younger people have been responsible for the highest number of new infections. In the U.S., infections among children are just one factor in an explosion of cases. In just three weeks last month, more than half a million kids under 12 tested positive. The return to school more nerve-wracking than ever. Carolyn Dunn shows us a country under terrible strain. It was supposed to be a summer of vaccination and relaxation in the United States. Instead, as the season winds down, a reckoning, a COVID surge that's filling intensive care units to the brim. 1,500 people a day are dying, almost all of them unvaccinated. We've lost 24 additional people since Friday. I'll ask for your prayers again, but I'll ask more than anything for you to get yourself vaccinated to stop this. Four million Americans were infected last month alone. One out of every five was a child. There's no definitive data about whether the Delta variant is making kids sicker than previous strains, but hospitalizations of children and teens increased fivefold over a six-week period. 
Four-year-old Lincoln Zimmerman got so sick he was fighting for breath from his hospital bed, leaving his doctor mother feeling helpless. He said, Mom, I just don't feel good. I don't think I'm going to go home. That's the thing that nobody wants to hear their four-year-old say. Personnel in the school surround the children with vaccinated people. But less than 54% of the population is double vaccinated in the United States. And a third shot will be added to the regular vaccine schedule by month's end. We may have needed three doses all along, just as other vaccines need three doses in order to have an appropriate amount. Health authorities estimate those three doses will need to be taken by 90% of those eligible in the U.S. to get COVID under control. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Washington. Well, today the Taliban announced it has taken control of the last pocket of resistance in Afghanistan. It says it's more tolerant, but there continue to be signs that's not the case. Senior correspondent Susan Ormiston is in neighboring Pakistan. Another white and black flag goes up, this one in Panjshir province, filmed by the Taliban, who say they've now captured all of the country. In the deep valleys northwest of Kabul, the son of a famed Mujahideen commander was still urging Afghans today to keep resisting, denying a complete loss. Ahmed Massoud chastised the international community for negotiating with the Taliban, legitimizing it. A week since Americans pulled out of Kabul, Taliban murals are painted over the U.S. Embassy entrance. Men and women resuming university classes are segregated by gender, a huge curtain dividing them. Several women's protests over the last few days demanding a role in government and civil society were ultimately broken up. Zubail Mujahid repeating today that women can work, yes, but only in areas allowed by Islamic law, not clarified. So many people left. Next door in Pakistan, Interior Minister Sheikh Rashid Ahmad told CBC his country is wary. Do you trust that they will do what they say they're doing now? There is no other option but to trust. What can you do? But Pakistan is doing more, a regional interest exerting its influence, starting with Pakistan's intelligence chief, General Faiz Hamid, on a visit to Kabul over the weekend reportedly to discuss border security, amongst other sensitive issues. No, Don't worry, everything will be okay. <laughs> the Taliban denied today that infighting amongst factions was delaying a new government, promising again that one will come in the next few days, but that could mean the Taliban officially sealing its power over Afghanistan close to the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Islamabad. Well, American actor Michael K. Williams has died in New York. He was best known for his role as Omar Little on the HBO series The Wire. The five-time Emmy nominee was found dead by a family member in his Brooklyn apartment this afternoon. He was 54 years old. Police say his death is being investigated as a possible overdose. Well, it has been a summer of record heat and drought across the prairies, and it is taking a toll on some businesses already struggling. Everything has gone up, especially the produce and the meat prices. And we understand that it's still going up. Up next, the rising costs pushing some restaurants to the brink. And we'll have much more special campaign coverage from Montreal. It's really a three uh, parties fighting right now. It's not between Liberals and Bloc. It's really a three fighting parties. How voters are feeling in a province that could make all the difference on election night. That's still ahead this evening. But first, a preview of what Adrian's working on for tomorrow night. Oh, a big Labor Day hello from Cochrane, Alberta, and the rodeo after a weekend of parades and festivals. And yeah, some reluctant political talk. Mention the federal election here, you get a lot of big, frustrated sighs, and also a sense that this is obviously a lot more complicated than an expected sea of conservative blue. We're in the riding of Banff Airdrie. It has four choices for the right of center vote, yet it's right next to a riding that pollsters consider viable for the Liberals. So, what does Alberta want? Ultimately, it comes down to real representation. There's a lot to talk about. We're here to listen, and we'll see you tomorrow night.
Welcome back. The National is on the road tonight in Montreal as we count down to Election Day, now just two weeks away. Tonight, we are looking at why Quebec is once again such a crucial battleground in this campaign. We'll have that in a few minutes. First, though, some of the other stories that we're watching for you. The search for a suspect in a deadly shooting in Saskatchewan is over. Police arrested 33-year-old Sean Mustus in Melfort tonight. Two people were killed and another injured in a shooting last night on the James Smith Cree Nation. Police say they are not looking for any additional suspects at this time. A dramatic scene in New Brunswick waters this morning. Four fishermen were rescued from this sinking herring boat. The crew sent a distress call, and within minutes, about eight boats converged, ready to help. The captain says he believes he hit a buoy, which may have damaged the boat. Well, this year's drought on the prairies is straining the food supply chain. Not only is it driving up prices for regular, everyday Canadians, it's also just one more problem for already struggling restaurants. Omira Issa shows us how some owners are being pushed to the brink. I need uh, memories of Luxburger to go, please. It's been almost two months since COVID-19 restrictions have been lifted in Saskatchewan, and customers are flooding into this restaurant in downtown Regina. It's a small sigh of relief for owner Thomas Sierkos at a time when he's feeling the pinch of the cost of doing business. Everything has gone up, especially the produce and the meat prices, and we understand that it's still going up. Sierko says the price of beef and produce has soared by 12 percent. With drought driving commodity prices up across the prairies, restaurants are feeling it. When the drought is happening and when our farmers don't have a good yield and don't have the, the results that they anticipate, it affects our business. This is a vegetable In the heart of Winnipeg's downtown, this restaurant owner knows the struggle to keep up with rising prices all too well. We're not making much money. She says the cost of meat and vegetables has almost doubled for her. Thank you. An increase in costs she's had to pass on to her customers. We're working at losses right now, but at least we're getting enough to pay the bills until Things change. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba have all seen record heat levels and little rain this year. Grain growers of Canada are projecting historically low yields across the prairies amid unprecedented drought conditions. Experts say the ripple effects will be felt across the entire Canadian economy. The ag sector is important, and uh, if that sector isn't doing well, it has all sorts of implications. And the full impact will be felt through the fall and winter. Back in Regina, Thomas Sierkos is hoping for better days so he could keep serving his customers as he has been for the past 32 years. Omer Isa, CBC News, Regina. Well, you're watching our special election coverage from Montreal. We have much more ahead for you, so don't go anywhere, including a look at the issues driving voters in Quebec. As we go to break, here's what's on the minds of some of them that we spoke to. Hello, my name is Anjali Avasti, and I'm a professor at Concordia University. In the coming federal elections, I want that the government should focus on sustainability and efforts that make the planet more green, a more healthy place to live in. My name's Jackie, and one of the most important things to me is Indigenous rights. The idea of nation to nation, which was promised last time, but really hasn't been followed through because we're you know, anybody who's not indigenous to this place is on stolen land and that needs to be recognized. I'm Sally. I think what's important for the upcoming elections are that we really take care of the environment and there's a lot of focus around those issues uh, just because our environment is dying and there's a lot of extreme weather, so we really need to take care of it. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, hello. We are back with special election coverage from Quebec. Political fortunes can shift very quickly here. And with exactly two weeks left to Election Day, that is precisely what some campaigns are counting on. Much of Montreal considered a liberal stronghold. But you don't have to go all that far outside the city before the map gets a lot more open. 
the riding of Trois-Rivières, just between Montreal and Quebec City. It is a place struggling with a very specific problem. Too many people out of work, but not in the way that you might think. Now, I paid a visit to the riding yesterday and found a place full of hope, hardship, and history that might just tell us something about how election night 2021 might unfold. No shortage of people here. Saturday night in Trois-Rivières, a place where people like their baseball and their beer. It's Team Quebec against the New Jersey Jackals, two teams on the field. But in the federal riding that translates as three rivers, it is very much a three-way race. And the thing that concerns so many people here? We have so many jobs to fill right now. There's people like in the hotels, everywhere. They're, they're, they're crying for people, but they're staying at home and just taking the money because they're, they're still getting it. It's, it's, it. They're getting more money staying at home than they would be working. I don't know. Maybe it's time to change. Trois-Rivières is the heartbeat of an entire region, an economic, cultural, and gastronomical hub. But the engine has stalled. Here's what I mean. The iconic Rue des Forges, the city's busiest street. Normally, over the course of a holiday Monday, it would do really, really good business. And it will, but it really depends on where you go. Look at this sign here, Cuisinier Demandé. They're looking for a cook. This restaurant here won't even open today. And for a place like this, that's not just unusual, it's unheard of. For the restaurant, it's du jamais vu. We have a list of posts. Presently, we have seven posts vacant that are in affichage, and we don't get practically any CV. Le Grec is an institution, been here on the riding's edge for three generations. But the co-owner, Ioanna Yiannopoulos, tells us the restaurant just doesn't have enough staff to stay open seven days a week. It can manage five right now, but figures even that will soon drop down to four. Same story at Le Brasier 1908, named for a devastating fire that completely leveled Trois-Rivières' downtown core a century ago. There was time I say, how, how could we go over, you know? No revenue, and uh, I have to pay uh, the rent, I have to pay, uh, I have to keep a contact with the employees. Economy is one block affecting another block, affecting another block. The farm that bring me the chicken, I have less chicken to, and the farmer, we have, have less money to buy, and all the economy will be uh, slowed down. And that's why we have to think a new way to take this challenge together. It is why every major political contender in this riding spends a lot of time talking about the economy. The bloc candidate believes financial supports like the CERB are to blame. The program should be uh, suspended, but we, sh we would keep a few uh, areas open as cultural industries and uh, basically the event, the event industry. They still have big problems, but the rest of the people, I mean, most of them, I, I think, don't want to work. <laughs> the bloc won this riding in 2019, but consider the conservative candidate. Yves Lavaque was mayor of Trois-Rivières for 17 years. And for those worried about their pocketbooks, there is comfort in that. Yves Lavaque is a, a art worker, a, uh, and he knew a lot of people to, to create a, a good economy and environment. So I think uh, Yves Lévesque is the, the best people to do, uh, to do this job. Merci beaucoup. Then there's the liberal candidate, also a household name. Martin Francoeur was a journalist who worked for the local daily, Le Nouvelliste, for nearly three decades. His face, his words, his ideas go a long way. Martin Francoeur, qui est candidat libéral pour Trois-Rivières. But here, the challenge is keeping the campaign on the rails. The Commissioner of Canada Elections is investigating Francoeur over the way he solicited political donations. And even some of his past writings, critical of the party he now represents, have come back to haunt him. When the campaign started, I could have bet on the Liberal. But now it's been only two weeks and everything has changed. It's really too close to call. Too close to call. <laughs> Paul Vermont des Roches knows Francoeur's work well. She too is a journalist, 20 years in the business, also working for Le Nouvelliste. She's a columnist. It's really a three, 
uh, parties fighting right now. Because of that, because of the dynamic between Bloc and Liberal, the Conservative could make some, uh, some, some breakthrough in Quebec that they didn't, they, they didn't do on the, on the last election, which could make the difference between minority, majority, and even Liberal losing. Translation, it's anybody's game. So who comes out on top? Well, tonight, not the home team. But on the campaign trail, only way to find out is to keep on playing. So listen, keep Trois-Rivières in mind on election night, because the experts do see it as a kind of trend bellwether. In 2011, it voted NDP, along with that orange wave. We all remember that. In 2019, it voted Bloc, along with that Bloc surge. So we'll see what happens in 2021. But let's uh, pull things out here. Alison Northcott joining me right now because Alison, even when you know so many of those voters that I spoke to in Trois-Rivières, I remember they would say l'économie, but also l'environnement. And, and you live here in Quebec. You must have been hearing something of the same. Absolutely. That's definitely uh, the environment. It's definitely an important issue for a lot of people. And there's one project that touches on that that's really come up a lot in this campaign. It's all about an underwater tunnel that would connect two communities. And while some say it might be good for some in those communities, there is also a lot of concern about the price tag and about the impact on the environment. For years, Colette Langlais and Jean-Marie Mercier have used this bridge to travel between Quebec City and their home on the other side of the river. They say traffic on this and the other bridge nearby can be slow, frustrating and unpredictable, and they want another option. He says it would save people time and gas and reduce pollution and the risk of an accident. A new project for a so-called third link is in the works. The Quebec government has announced a seven to ten billion dollar six-lane underwater tunnel connecting the municipality of Lévis to Quebec City. The premier wants federal leaders to commit to funding 40 percent of it. They paid for the Champlain Bridge in Montreal, says Langlais. Why shouldn't they pay for a tunnel or a bridge for us? The province says one-third of the lanes would be reserved for public transport and carpooling. But in an election where climate change is a pressing issue for many voters, many see the project as a step backwards and an issue they'll take to the ballot box. On the other side of the river, David Lemelin, a former mayoral candidate in Quebec City, is against the project and says he won't vote for a federal party that supports it. You say that you care about the, the, the public money, you say that you care about the environment, you say that you care about the, the, the quality of life in, in the cities. Well, the third link is not doing that. Environmental groups say the planned tunnel would mean more cars and more emissions. We see this uh, project as being one that's scientifically unfounded um, in many respects and so we do believe that uh, there should be no federal funding going towards this project. It goes against Canada's climate objectives and Quebec's as well. The NDP is against the project, the Liberals have not committed to the funding and the Conservatives say they're on board. Les évaluations environnementales relèvent de Québec. Bloc Québécois leader Yves-François Blanchette, who positions his party as anti-pipeline and pro-environment, faced criticism after suggesting it could potentially have a positive environmental impact and saying he doesn't hate the Third Link, which is a popular project in the Quebec City area. But the project is also very unpopular elsewhere, saying, hey, we're going to pay 10 billion of taxpayer money for uh, f f basically to, to cut 15 minutes in transit to the people on the south shore of Quebec. No, why should we do that? The debate over the project will continue after this election with construction set to begin next year. So Alison, uh, talk to me about the bigger picture here, right? Because in an important way, this is a, a local project, yet it has found a way to, to ripple out in a wider way. Well, that's because this is something that Premier Francois Legault wants to be a priority for the federal leaders, and he is a popular premier, so it makes it hard for the leaders to ignore that. Now, the project still has to go through an environmental assessment, and once it's built, the, the province says that uh, it, they expect that it would last for 100 years. Okay. Alison Northcott, thank you very much. You're welcome. Meanwhile, here's another look at the beautiful Montreal skyline tonight. Up next, how the tide has already shifted in Quebec in just a few short weeks, and whether there's a chance we could see yet another course change before election night.
Welcome back to the national special election coverage from Quebec, a perfect place to watch, especially at this point in the campaign. Now, in the past, savvy on the ground observers have picked up on trends here that upend conventional wisdom and define the final days of the race. So who better to bring in than Emilie Nicolas, columnist with Le Devoir, in person, what a novel concept that is in a pandemic. <laughs> right? So uh, start by just kind of bringing us up to speed on the state of play in this province in particular, because it looks meaningfully different than at the outset of the campaign. Yes, so uh, the Liberals are still in the lead with roughly one third of the voting intentions. Um, the Bloc is second with one fourth of the voting intention. Uh, then the Conservatives with one fifth, so 20% of voting intentions. And then the, the NDP behind with 20%. Uh, the Liberals and the Bloc are a little bit down, since, as you were saying, since the beginning of the campaign, but they're still uh, in the lead. The Conservatives have been going up, but they're still not quite in that pay zone. So they might be gaining scenes in the Quebec City region and in Trois Rivières, as you have been exploring earlier, but they're not uh, as at the level of, in terms of number of seats where the Bloc and the Liberals are, which is why nationally you're saying the Liberals uh, behind the, the Conservatives in terms of voting intention, but still ahead in terms of potential number of seats. You know, it's really interesting to think about the interplay between the parties, particularly in a place in like Quebec, where you have the Bloc Québécois yes. as that other factor. But I'm also thinking of the issues at play, right? I mean, how are they different in Quebec? I mean, if you had to pick one or two key ones in this province, how Quebecers look at them differently than, say, the rest of Canada? Well, one of the key issues that was brought up, actually, in the, the first French language debate that was had last week, uh, is the issue of childcare. Um, it's, uh, it's something that matters nationally, but at the same time here, we already have a childcare national system. So people are worried about, for example, a lot of mothers who are looking to go back into the workforce, but are still waiting for a spot right. in those uh, childcare. Uh, so as, as a result of that, uh, the money is more about creating more spots and it's also about making sure that there would be uh, um, the agreement between the Justin Trudeau and Francois Legault would be respected whoever comes in power next and so that's something that got actually even a little bit of heat in the last night last week's debate in terms of whether or not he would keep uh, the agreement that uh, Justin Trudeau has struck with the Quebec premier and even I mean on the environmental front I mean yes. we heard Allison's reporting earlier but this is an issue that plays very differently in Quebec than it would elsewhere yes so Quebec obviously is not the only province that cares about the environment. What might be different here uh, is that sometimes there's a little bit of a nationalistic flavor mm -hmm. in the way that we talk about the environment. And so, for example, uh, the Bloc will say they care about the environment, but will also say that the Liberals cannot be trusted because it's Canadian and Canadian uh, Canada, Alberta is part of Canada and there are pipelines over there. And so there is uh, a lot of opposition uh, to pipelines in Quebec like elsewhere in Canada. But here it's playing out in a way that can sometimes give some ammunition to the Bloc. Last question for you. I mean, over the last couple of weeks, we have seen something of a, of a, of a leveling out, right, between the parties. The Conservatives yeah. doing better than one would have expected yeah. at the outset of the campaign. What would change things, if anything, at this point? Yes, uh, a lot of the times in just in 2019 with Andrew Scheer, uh, when the Conservatives are going up, uh, then they are being attacked on some of their more social conservative values that don't play as well in Quebec. In the last days, what we've seen uh, is Irene O'Toole being attacked on his position on gun control. And that is very much an issue that a lot of Quebecers care about, given the history with the Polytechnique and also the history, the more recent history for the Quebec City mos mosque shooting as well. And so the, you know, whether or not a position will try to paint Amy O'Toole as the person who likes gun, that remains to be seen. Uh, but it, that is one of the ways in which the, 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 the race could change in the days ahead. Interesting stuff. Emily Nicola, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Once again, in person. We have to do it again. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, meantime, we do have lots more special election coverage coming to you this week. Tomorrow, Adrian brings us a Western perspective. What's at stake in Alberta? On Thursday, voters put questions on climate, affordability, and COVID to the federal leaders at the English debate. That starts at 9 p.m. Eastern. And we will have all the analysis you'll need after with a special edition of The National, including chief political correspondent Rosie Barton and, of course, the At Issue panel. Well, as kids head back to classes tomorrow, the fourth wave is not the only concern. The pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on low-income families, on Indigenous communities, uh, on racialized communities.
Coming up, how for many families, getting back to school supplies can be a real struggle. Welcome back. There are new challenges as students go back to school across the country. The stresses of COVID safety, certainly one of them. Also catching up after a strange year of learning. But for some, that's on top of the old challenge of not having the right school supplies to begin with. And on that front, as we'll hear from Jayla Bernstein, this year there is a higher demand for help. Piles of school supplies, packed, stacked, and driven from Toronto to an Ojibwe community near Thunder Bay. It's not so exciting. This man is on his way home after overseeing the backpack distribution operation. I got to see a lot of great smiles on children's faces and family members' faces just seeing them walking in and being excited to be able to pick up a backpack. Um, it helped me realize like how much of an impact just giving a bag of school supplies has on a young person's life. His Toronto organization gathered a total of 150 bags. They were handed out to students in Fort William yeah, yeah. First Nation. It's just one of many communities in Canada where families are struggling. Just returning to school in the middle of a pandemic is really difficult for them. There's been a lot of ups and downs, um, you know, going to in-person versus virtual. Um, so a big emotional toll on the community. There's also a loss of income for sure. It's been a tough year for the community between the pandemic and ongoing trauma caused by residential schools. If we could get support to them for school supplies and they don't have to worry about that, that's one thing less off their plate. Similar needs are springing up in Halifax, too, where this Salvation Army is answering calls for donations. Many who kind of share the story of, I've always helped the Salvation Army, I've donated, never thought I would be the recipient of that support, but the realities of COVID, job loss, job impact, uh, have really, we've seen a good 10, 15% of brand new clients. It's not just back to school supplies. Advocates say they're seeing parents in Canada struggle with a whole host of new pressures. The impact of the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on low income families, on indigenous communities, uh, on racialized communities. And I think that's that's a really important message. Programs like these hope to offer some relief and make back to school a little less stressful for everyone. Jayla Bernstein, CBC News, Toronto. Now, a whole lot of kids are going back to school tomorrow, the day after Labor Day. Coming up, we're going to show you a very colorful welcome that certainly takes outdoor art to a different level. That's next. While some Canadian kids are back in school already, for others, the end of the Labor Day weekend signals that big change. Either way, one Maritimer has an idea how to engage students the old school way. An airbrush artist from Miramichi, New Brunswick, wants to make the outdoors fun again. His secret to make the playground pop is our moment. I'm a sprinkler fitter by trade, yeah, but I also paint. <laughs> All right. The 3D illusion is what kind of sets them apart from the other playground games. I do the uh, 3D hopscotch the uh, snakes and ladder games, um, some large snakes with letters and numbers in them for educational purposes. It's a way to get them away from screens and back in touch with nature, playing some of the playground games that maybe we played when we were younger. This has been a really good uh, community gathering of the whole thing. Everybody's really come together and really, yeah, really enjoying it all. It's, it's a big part of our community school to be supporting anything that comes from our community and um, there's also a big push in the district and in the province for outdoor learning and social emotional learning so it was just a great time to tie all of those things in together. I'll tell you why I love this. At my kids school they've painted you know, just a small section of fence, really vibrant rainbow colors. No, no words or anything around it, just the colors and my kids can't get enough of it. They love it, they want to be around it, they want to pass by it, they really enjoy themselves. So that, the kids are gonna go bonkers over. That's pretty awesome. From Montreal, that is The National for this September 6th. Bonne nuit, good night.